science part of breast, breast oncology all the way uh, through clinical cancer care, and then also has quite a bit of advocacy involved in it. And so there are many different um, important things that come out of the meeting, everything from the very, very, very roots of where we figure out a lot about breast cancer, all the way out to how we bring changes to the clinic. So just diving right in, um, one of the most important presentations at ASCO this year was the first presentation um, with the finalized initial data from the Natalie trial. And some of you may be familiar with this. So the Natalie trial, the synopsis is on the left. So over 5,000 men and women who have ER positive early stage breast cancer, so curable breast cancer that has not spread around the body, uh, but could be in the lymph nodes, were randomized to adding a CDK4-6 inhibitor, which is a highly targeted tablet pill, which is similar to um, palbociclib or Ibrantz and similar to abemocyclib or Verzeniol. So this is with the third of the three CDK4-6 inhibitors, and it's the last to publish data in the adjuvant or curable setting. And this study looked at more than 5,000 women to see if you added this extra pill, in this case, for three years, in addition to endocrine therapy, so this still means a woman is taking anti-estrogen treatment after surgery, but in addition to that, also taking this highly targeted pill compared to not taking that targeted pill, whether or not there's improvement in things like survival, risk of distance spread, risk of local recurrence. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see some specifics. So men and women both included. Um, uh, Ribosiclib is also, also goes by the name Kiskali is the brand name. It is taken twice a day and in this study for uh, three years. Um, you take it three weeks on and one week off, similar to Ibrantz, for those of you familiar with Ibrantz. Um, and you would either take it with the aromatase inhibitor uh, by, by itself or the aromatase inhibitor with ovarian suppression if necessary. So men have to do uh, ovarian suppression, actually, interestingly, and uh, women who have not yet uh, completed the menopause have to do uh, ovarian suppression. And they had to be considered high risk. Um, and there's some details about what high risk means here on the right-hand side of the slide, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, high risk stage 2A or stage 2B or higher, but not stage 4, ER positive, HER2 negative. So someone both has to have a curable breast cancer, estrogen fueled um, at the beginning of their treatment, HER2 negative. Um, and here on the right, you can see that stage 2A is a uh, breast cancer stage in which the lymph nodes are negative, uh, but um, in this situation, you were considered high risk if you were if you had a grade two tumor with uh, a high proliferation rate. So that's that key 67, KI 67 that you see there that's over or equal to 20%, a high risk oncotype score. So 26 or higher where we recommend chemotherapy um, or other high risk uh, genomic risk profiling. So what does that mean? That's like the mama print, or there are some other um, institutional-based genomic risk profiles that would allow someone to be eligible, um, or grade three. So it means that uh, women or men in this situation either were uh, a high-risk stage 2A, where the lymph nodes were not involved, or they had lymph node involvement, which you can see here. Um, stage 2B and higher um, typically means it involves a lymph nodes unless it's a very large tumor. You can see also here that the women and men that were included could have been on endocrine therapy for up to 12 months at the time they started on the study. And then they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to adding this extra pill versus not adding this extra pill. And then you can see here on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, beyond the synopsis, the primary endpoint is IDFS, which is alphabet soup in oncology, invasive disease-free survival. So basically anything that women and men facing breast cancer care about, which is do they have a new invasive breast cancer event? So things like a DCIS, that wouldn't count, um, but a new lesion anywhere in the body that is an invasive breast cancer, that's IDFS, invasive disease-free survival. So they were comparing 
whether uh, women and men with this combination did better than those who received just the pill that we use now, uh, uh, an aromatase inhibitor specifically. Um, secondary endpoints, so recurrence-free survival, so similarly making sure that uh, they didn't have a recurrence event, things like DCIS. Um, distant disease-free survival, that's just checking to see who has uh, a spread of their breast cancer on either arm of this study. Overall survival, how long do women live uh, and men live after this? PROs are patient reported outcomes. So how tolerable is this? What about the quality of life? What do people say real time as opposed to just safety and tolerability, which is what are we already accounting for that we ask and people check off in a checkbox? So PROs are deeper, patient reported outcomes. What do they say in a journal-like setting? PKs are pharmacokinetics. You know, how does it look? Um, what are the levels in someone's body? And then you can see here on the next slide, uh, just a quick overview of the mechanism of action uh, for ribosiclib. Um, so here you can see that uh, on the left-hand side of uh, the slide, I'm just defining that this is a combination of endocrine therapy with CDK4-6 inhibitors. On the right side of the slide, you see the cancer cell is kind of the pink blob. The blue inner circle is the nucleus of the cell. So what happens is aromatase inhibitors or uh, medicines like fulvestrin, which at the moment I'm not going to talk about, and tamoxifen, those medicines are able to gain access into the breast cancer cell and block the estrogen receptor at the site of the nucleus of the cell. And what that does, if you sort of track down here, is it prevents this progression of, you'll see G1 to S. All that means is cell division, cell replication. So the estrogen reducing medications that you see here, AIs, fulvestrin, tamoxifen, those are one way of preventing cell replication and cell reproduction. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the three CDK4-6 inhibitors. So what they do is they act at this particular um, enzyme in this process to additionally block inside the nucleus uh, the building blocks for cell replication. And so it's basically trying to use synergy to prevent breast cancer cells from growing and dividing in two different ways at the same time. So what did they find? They found that the invasive disease-free survival in the women and men that received the study medicine, ribosiclib, which is currently FDA approved like the other two CDK4-6 inhibitors in the metastatic setting, that using it in the curative setting was more curative. That's the takeaway. The invasive disease-free survival was just over 90% at their first data poll, which is at the three-year mark, versus 87%. So some of the things to think about with this three-year mark numbers are, number one, uh, is this a difference which will persist? Is this a survival benefit in invasive disease? Is this like an, an invasive disease-free survival benefit that will persist? So three years, this is when people are coming off of the medicine. Is this a difference that will continue on later? Uh, will the curves come closer together where it mattered at first, but then people, as they come off the medicine, the cancer is then able to grow or spread. Um, and then lastly, uh, will the curves potentially separate more? So one thing that's interesting with abemacyclib, which has been tested in a highly similar setting uh, after starting endocrine therapy, in with abemacyclib, women and men who took abemacyclib early on after surgery, who were high risk in the ways I mentioned, there was a continuing separation of the curve where they not only uh, had a survival benefit, but that survival benefit grew over time, which is really interesting. So side effects, which is really important in anything in the curative setting, whereas you can see here, um, over 90% of individuals were already uh, being cured with this combination and 87% with just the standard medicine. Side effects were that there was more joint pain than just being on the aromatase inhibitor by itself. And that will not be a popular side effect in my clinic experience. And neutropenia. So neutropenia is when your immune system infection fighting cells are low, and that can be challenging, especially since uh, the advent of COVID. Um, 
where is this? Like, how much does this matter to all of us right now? This isn't a holding pattern. Until the FDA reviews the safety and the disease-free survival and says that they think on balance, this is something that is a good medication to prescribe until that is said it is not currently available for this indication. There is a different medication, abemacyclib, that is available for certain women and men who have a high risk ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer, but the requirements for that and this are not entirely the same. The Natalie trial was three years of a medicine and abemacyclib on the monarchy trial, that's only two years of a medicine. So that is also another difference in terms of cost and side effects. The other thing to keep in mind is that the abemacyclib study with monarchy that was talked about in prior lectures, that's actually something that's a higher risk group of men and women than Natalie, which included some women who were no negative, who were not as high risk as the abemacyclib study. So the key message, this is important, keep our eye out for it. It's not yet ready for prime time. It wouldn't surprise me if sometime in quarter one of 2024, this was uh, on deck for the FDA. So on that same vein, Monarch E uh, is a study in a very similar way, which looked at a slightly different CDK4-6 inhibitor called abemacyclib, also known as Verzenio. And there was an update on their data because they are trying to be more inclusive over time with uh, what people need and what the side effects are and, and how does it go when we need to adjust for side effects. So what the monarchy updated data showed was that whether someone was 25 or 85, they had similar benefit of monarchy, so of, of Verzenio for two years, meaning that just because someone is 75 or 80, they still have a substantially higher cure rate with giving them this second pill for the first two years uh, of endocrine therapy, they would take two pills together. The key message with that is that we always wanna know, is it worth going through more and more treatment as someone advances in age? And is it necessary to be more aggressive just because someone is younger? And what we found in general over time in breast oncology is that even with advancing age, the benefit still stands. So if someone is healthy and high functioning and thought to have a very good other, other health, um, then it would be just as beneficial for them to receive these medications as someone else. Uh, and then also we've found over time that younger and younger patients, you don't necessarily have to be more aggressive just because of age. Um, when the dose of Verzenio or abemacyclib needed to be lower for diarrhea, for fatigue, those are the most common side effects of Verzenio, the benefit was the same. So something I've always wanted to be able to reassure my patients is that in most clinical trials, eventually, we, when, you, when we look in hindsight, if you lower the dose because of side effects, not just because, but because of side effects, then the benefit stays the same. And that is very reassuring to all of us that when someone is struggling through some kind of treatment, you don't need to be a martyr and we don't need to ignore what's happening and the quality of life that we can appropriately reduce your dose without impacting your cure rate. Um, Diarrhea continues to be the primary toxicity of abemacyclib, and that's not really new information, unfortunately, that continues to be the largest challenge of that particular medicine. So here you can see that in comparison to the ribosiclib data that I showed on the Natalie trial, the monarchy trial showed a slightly bigger reduction um, in recurrence events, a slightly better improvement in the cure rate. You'll also notice that the numbers at the three-year mark, if you want to compare apples to apples. So remember that this is a bemacyclib. This is taken for two years. So at that 24-month mark is where they come off of treatment. And you can see that those that received the medicine, 92.6% are living without any kind of recurrence uh, versus 89.5%. Then at the 36 month mark, that's comparing similar numbers to the, the Natalie study we just looked at. What you can see here is that both of those numbers are a little bit lower. And that's because these women and men on this study are higher risk 
than the Natalie study. What's interesting though, is you can actually appreciate that those two curves, whether or not you took both pills or just one, those two curves are actually separating over time. Meaning that despite the fact that they finish a bemocyclib at the two year mark, their benefit is substantial enough that they continue to have not just better survival, but even more survival benefit once they are finished compared to those who never had the medication. So what, what does that mean to us, you know, in our wild breast oncology brains? What that means is that we think that abemocyclib and ribociclib actually are able to kill micro -met metastatic cancer cells, not just delay their growth, not just arrest their development, but actually kill them off because here you can see that there is a larger separation over time, even after they're off the medicine. So that's the uh, background of what we believe to be the case. This is a um, meta-analysis that I thought was really interesting. Caveats with a meta-analysis is you are taking many different studies with all sorts of different people, with all sorts of different um, bells and whistles of what was going on with their cancer at the time. However, they oftentimes will have good takeaway points for us. So this was a meta-analysis that was presented showing that in 25 studies with 15,000 women, ovarian suppression for premenopausal women in general reduced the risk of recurrence and death about 18%. I will just say that A, this is not breakthrough or shocking, but it continues to build evidence for all of us that it is important to lower estrogen after an estrogen positive breast cancer. And women who are after the menopause, who are only making a little bit of estrogen, that is very possible to do with an aromatase inhibitor pill. And women whose ovaries are on and are this massive factory of estrogen, it is not as good to just try to get by with a pill in general. That won't hold in every scenario, but in general. And so this is showing that the recurrence rate in the control group versus the ovarian suppression group is substantially different. Women who are premenopausal before chemotherapy and received chemotherapy had a much higher risk of recurrence if they had a resumption of ovarian function or resumption of menses or periods after chemotherapy. This data, the only other thing to know is that these numbers and risk of recurrence are far higher than what we just looked at in a much higher risk population. So the other caveat is meta-analyses on all these old studies are older data. And so part of what's harder to know is how much does this relate to how we practice now and how much treatment is too little and how much is too much. One of the takeaways from this for me is that in young women who still have ovarian function, who are high risk, there is a substantial benefit to turning off their ovaries, at least for a period of time. Uh, women who were under 45, uh, were shown to have a recurrence rate that was more than 10% higher if they did not have their ovaries turned off. And those that were closer to menopause, so mid 40s to mid 50s, had a lesser but still, but still a prevalent benefit. One of the challenges um, with this study is that some of these studies that went into the meta-analysis were before we necessarily knew which types of endocrine therapy to use when and whether or not the ovarian suppression occurred by itself. So in 2023, we don't use ovarian suppression by itself as a treatment. You use that and you use a medication. Um, and that's because the sources of estrogen in the body, one of them is the ovaries, but the fat cells and the adrenal glands also make estrogen. So if all you do is turn off the ovaries, you still have, just like in a postmenopausal woman, you still have production of some estrogen and so one of the problems with this meta-analysis is that 
there were some women in this study who were on over ovarian suppression without tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor. And that's not something we would do these days. So those who were taking ovarian suppression with a pill had much less benefit of the ovarian suppression, which makes sense because they basically were not on standard treatment back then if they were on ovarian suppression alone. So some of the challenges, this is interesting to see. It does support the notion that in the right patients, it's probably beneficial to turn off their ovaries in certain scenarios. Um, this was with older treatments, older chemotherapies, older combinations of medicines, and it's super general. You know, in, in hindsight, in breast oncology, we nowadays are incredibly individualized and specific in our treatment. And back then it was, it was, uh, very generalized and, and complicated, and many people were over or under treated. Um, so this is something that I'll discuss with my patients. The absolute benefit of ovarian suppression has to be weighed against tolerability. So it puts young women into menopause immediately, and it holds them there until you stop the medicine. And then you also have to think about things like quality of life and sexual function, um, you know, impact on bone thinning, things like that. Uh, so this is this is worthwhile thinking about, not something that we'll do in every young woman. So this, I thought, was a really interesting uh, study that was presented because this is something that I had not given much thought to. I've always advised patients that the best time to take the medicine that I would like for you to take is the time that you remember to take it. I don't care, you know, like green eggs and ham. You can take it in a car, on a plane, in a train, with food, without food. As long as you take it, it makes me happy. Um, and there's some basic science that uh, supports the notion that in women, there are variations in our secretion of certain hormones around bedtime that are not female hormones, just in general, like sleep hormones, melatonin, things like that, that may be a biologic basis that taking a medicine like tamoxifen at night may be more beneficial than taking tamoxifen in the morning. And this is one of those things that um, is very interesting that people come up with after things that they study in the lab and that in clinic, we don't think about this quite as much. So this was a study where they randomized thousands of patients to either take their tamoxifen in the morning or take it at night. And then they had them self-report exactly what phase of the day they took it in. Interestingly, the women who women and men who are on AI uh, also reported what time that they took it because they were actually trying to see if tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors had diurnal variation or did it matter in your cure rate what time you took the medicine. And what's fascinating is that disease free survival, so cure rate, was improved in women who took tamoxifen at night. So it seems that there is synergy between secretion of melatonin and tamoxifen effect on tumors. And that has been seen in animal models. Better sleep and in general sleeping better does matter. And it matters for things like stress and secretion of hunger hormones and um, likely matters in breast cancer recurrence. And so if taking tamoxifen at night disrupts one's sleep. I would have them back it up to the time that does not do that. So I would envision that taking this at 5 p.m. is still better than taking it at 5 a.m. Uh, you know, with the data, but all else equal, taking it between 6 p.m. and bedtime in the study was associated with this benefit. What's also interesting is that the aromatase inhibitor arm showed no difference depending on what time you take the medication. Uh, so that that was very interesting. I would say about the, the last thing that I would say about the tamoxifen piece is that this is a free intervention that does not need any kind of okay from your oncologist to do because we in the past have always told people to take their medication when they remember to take it. And so I would advise people who are interested in this to go ahead and start taking their tamoxifen at night. When you receive a prescription of tamoxifen, it will say daily because that's the default of the prescribing system. That's just the default way it comes in there. So don't 
feel uh, married to that timing. You can switch your tamoxifen at, uh, to taking it at night, and um, there's no real concerns with that. The only medications that you would want to be wary of is if you take anything that can't be taken with any other medicines, you might need to separate those. That is most common with things like levothyroxine or the thyroid hormone, and those are typically taken at 6 or 6.30 in the morning on an empty stomach with no other medicines. So this is um, something that shouldn't necessarily interfere with that. So super interesting, free intervention, much more free than the other medicines I just talked about, and uh, and an easy thing to do. Um, I have many people set an alarm in their phone for when they're supposed to take their medication just to make it something that they are less likely to forget. So capivacertib is uh, a first in class new interesting medication. This is actually for the metastatic setting. It is not yet FDA approved, but we are getting there. And I wanted you to be able to see on the right-hand side, some of the very early data. So this is something that we have participated in these clinical trials uh, for the approval of capivacertib and our uh, patients. Some of them have had um, the ability to be on these very early studies showing that it is a better option than what we were previously using. So you can see on the right-hand side, this is a snippet from the New England Journal of Medicine article, and the reference is right there just in case you want to be able to look it up yourself. So this is for individuals uh, who have metastatic or advanced breast cancer that's um, HER2 negative, um, and this is something where they do have estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. They would have already had first line treatment. So that means that when you discover that a breast cancer has spread, you do the first treatment. So we call that first line treatment. And typically that's using an anti-estrogen combination, much like the medicines I was speaking about in the beginning. This would be for what we call second line treatment. And this is uh, a medication that you would give uh, in combination, I'm trying to see if you can see it well on the right. Okay, so on the right-hand side, those two bar plots, and it might be small for some of you. Um, this is comparing how long the treatment worked when they used an injectable selective estrogen receptor degrader, fulvestrant, also known as Facilidex. They used this new medicine in combination with that. And you can see here on the right that uh, the individuals on the study who received this new medicine, capivacertib, actually had the combination work for twice as long as those that did not receive the new medicine with the full fulvestrin. So that's important because we are in a constant state of trying to figure out how we can have more and more options that work for longer and longer that are well tolerated and prolong people's lives once they have a spread breast cancer. So here you can see this was over 700 women or men. So they have metastatic ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. And they either had full fulvestrin alone monthly, which is an injection. It's an intramuscular injection with or without oral capivacertib. This new medication is taken twice a day for four days and then three days off. The dosing schedule is a little bit of a nightmare in my opinion, because for people to keep track of that Sounds terrible. But anyways, that, you know, I didn't make that up, I promise. And then what we're looking at is how long did it work? Did they live longer? This is very early data here. And so you can see progression-free survival and all that means. And if you see it abbreviated, it'll say PFS, progression-free survival, is how long does someone continue on this combination without progression? Or how long did someone continue on this medicine before their cancer grew? And it was twice as long. So seven and a half months compared to three and a half months without this new medicine. There's a lot of basic science behind how they develop this medicine. It, uh, it arrests the development of breast cancer cells in something called the AKT pathway. That's all things that are pretty deep in the weeds, but it is something that is important and will probably very soon be coming to prime time. We actually are opening another clinical trial with uh, with this medication in a slightly different setting, but with the same kind of breast cancer. Um, so that's, this is important. This is a brand new 
brand new treatment option, you know, first time it's been proven to help uh, in breast cancer and will help add to new treatment options for uh, women and men facing advanced breast cancer. This was a nice uh, supportive medication um, clinical trial. So hand foot syndrome, some of you may be familiar with, or um, palmar plantar dyserythrodysesthesia, it's a mouthful, uh, is caused by things like zolota or capecitabine, doxal, um, which is a liposomal doxorubicin, that's an IV um, chemotherapy. It's typically caused by chemotherapies. It can be caused by some targeted therapies. And what happens is your hands and feet get red and sensitive and cracked and super sensitive to hot and cold. Because it's a known side effect of many of our medications, we have used in the past things like Utterly Cream, which is ironically the cream they use on cow udders when they are being milked frequently, which I always find to be humorous or gives us all back some of our humility in clinic. But that has been the mainstay of treatment. And other than that, you reduce the dose of the medicine causing the problem. What's interesting is that Voltaren gel, which is like a topical version of Advil-ish, a little bit like a topical version of Advil. It's over the counter. It is not a fancy medicine. It has been around for a long time. But in this study, they had people use Voltaren gel on their hands and feet if they're on a medicine that gives them commonly hand foot syndrome. And they were mainly the ones I just mentioned. And interestingly, it substantially reduced the amount of symptoms and hand foot syndrome that was seen. And so even just today, I recommended adding this for someone who uh, is having some hand foot syndrome problems. It's great because it means also that your ability to button things and put in earrings is better preserved. You don't feel like you have kind of tiny paper cuts all over your hands and feet. And it also means that we can, in those scenarios, maintain the dosing of the medication we're trying to use to shrink the cancer or cure the cancer. And using a medicine like this makes it better for everyone that we can kind of continue on that path. So then um, one of the other big updates, Tropics 2 is the name of the study. So sasituzumab is a fancy medicine. It's an antibody drug conjugate, which means that you have an antibody to something. So it goes through the body. It finds a particular shaped item that it's looking for. It binds to that. And then it acts a little bit like a Trojan horse. It drops the payload or chemotherapy molecule inside the cancer cell. So just like a Trojan horse, it comes up through the body, binds to the door of the castle, the door of the cancer cell, and then it comes in through a regular mechanism into the cancer cell, and then it drops off um, all the killing abilities through the chemotherapy. So that has kind of two main advantages. If you see anything that's an antibody drug conjugate, um, it's called an ADC, antibody drug conjugate. And the ones that you'll see the most commonly in breast cancer are sastuzumab, which is called Trodelvi. Uh, and you'll also see fam trastuzumab druxtecan, which is NHER2. Those are our two most common antibody drug conjugates. And what we saw in this study was that this fancy medicine, these uh, antibody drug conjugates are honestly the, the current future, the immediate future of not just breast oncology, but oncology in general. These are breakthrough. They are nothing short of miraculous in some cir circumstances. Um, it is an antibody drug conjugate against something called trope two. Uh, and it is currently FDA approved for metastatic triple negative breast cancer and metastatic ER positive, HER2 negative. So the only kind of breast cancer we don't yet use this medicine in is HER2 positive. Part of that is because metastatic HER2 positive individuals or individuals who have HER2 positive metastatic cancer, those individuals have a huge menu of options and this has just not yet been tested on them. Um, this medication is incredibly successful at killing cancer cells, even resistant cancer cells. So on the right-hand side, this large Y-shaped backbone, that's the antibody. Most antibodies you'll see depicted as a large Y-shape. 
Uh, the linkers are what hold on to the shopping bags full of chemotherapy. So they're like the little arms and they're holding the shopping bags full of chemotherapy. And then the chemotherapy molecules are these little orange spheres. So this treatment will go through the bloodstream, through a port, through the bloodstream, find this trope two antibody on cancer cells, particularly on breast cancer cells, bind to it, gain access into the cancer cell and drop off this orange bomb. And it kills the cancer cell and it can kill many of the cells around it as well, which is really impressive because even if not every cancer cell takes that up, it can get the other cancer cells in the area. It's kind of brilliant. Okay, so here's the survival uh, benefit of this medicine in the metastatic setting uh, for women and men with metastatic cancer. And so this is the presentation at ASCO. And you can see here that the separation of how early does someone do better on this versus a chemotherapy. So this is treatment of physician's choice. You'll see, I mean, it's always alphabet soup. I feel sorry for anyone trying to decipher what we're ever talking about. Um, TPC is treatment of physician's choice, meaning that half the people on the study got whatever chemotherapy we were otherwise going to use if we didn't have this fancy molecule. And half the people on the study got this new fancy molecule. And you can see that as early as four months, people getting the fancy molecule seen here in green, were already living longer. So not just having less progressive cancer, having better shrinkage of cancer, having better tolerability, all of which were also shown by this study, but they were also living longer and impressively so over time, several months longer. So the gold standard in metastatic cancer is not just better shrinkage and longer time that it works, but truly the gold standard uh, is having it so that people are able to have not just a better life, but a longer, better life. And so this medicine met that standard. Okay. And then now we dive into something that is the new kid on the block. So this is a brand new antibody drug conjugate. So similar idea to what I just mentioned. It's kind of like a cousin of NHER2, if any of you are aware of NHER2. I will not try to make anyone repeat in clinic patritumumab. I, you know, it's like we're, we must be getting desperate here, right? And uh, this is a novel HER3. We've never targeted the HER3 part of a breast cancer cell or other cancer cell. This is a HER3 targeted antibody drug conjugate. It's a super difficult target because HER3 exists in many places in the body and you really need to target it primarily in breast cancer cells. Early on, trying to figure out the right dose in very early phase studies, it looks like there are some good responses seen, but this is something to keep our eyes on because this is a payload, the orange box, directs TCAN. That is the payload that is on NHER2. That is the shopping bag of chemotherapy on NHER2. It's just linked to a different antibody. So if I were to bet, this will probably be a blockbuster like NHER2 because that has been a miracle medicine for many people. So anyways, this is early on. Uh, it is being studied. It is not something that we can remotely consider prescribing, but it's exciting because each of these antibody drug conjugates that causes uh, better cancer shrinkage is likely to be incredibly important in revolutionizing the cure rate over and over and over again as we move forward. So those were our ASCO updates. Um, new potential therapies that we saw. San Antonio is usually where we have sort of our most exciting things. Uh, San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium publishes a daily newsletter. And I believe anyone and everyone that's interested can sign up for their daily newsletter in December. And it will be December 5th to 8th is my recollection. I'll tell you the correct dates. Yes, 5th to 8th. And it is um, breast oncologists from all over the world. And it will be day after day after day of tons of 
important new data uh, for breast cancer and advocacy and tolerability all in one. Um, so keep your eye out for that. Sa sign up for the newsletter. I think through their website, you're able to do that. And Laura can give you also details on who's in charge of that update uh, conversation later this year. So questions. Oh, okay. For the Cappy Vassar tip. Oh, that's a great question. Okay. So for Cappy Vassar tip, hold on, let me show you. I put up, but it was too small, at least for my old eyes. Hold on. Okay. So, okay. Hold on. Let me show you. Okay. So everybody look at the um, progression free survival on the right hand side is with AKT pathway altered tumors. You can test for it. We look at this through Tempest testing, but you could do it through foundation medicine or Keras. There's a couple others that are out there. I use Tempest. Some, some of the other physicians will use foundation or Keras. Um, you can test for it. But what's interesting is interesting or wonderful. It depends on how you look at it. On the right-hand side, you can see people here with AKT pathway altered tumors had no greater benefit than just everybody else. So one of the benefits of not having it be too specific is, okay, great, this works in everybody. So maybe the AKT pathway is important, whether or not it looks extra turned on or just turned on in a normal breast cancer cell. Um, and the other takeaway that's nice is it means that the less uh, loopholes or the less hurdles that we have to go through to get something approved through insurance, like having this mutation, that mutation, this kind of testing, repeating it recently, things like that, then the faster people can access it. So you're right. They did test for that. There are ways of testing for it, but it looks like here early on, the benefit is the same with or without. Um, sasituzumab, oh, similar. Trope 2 was tested in all the sasituzumab studies, and it has made no difference whether you have more or less trope 2. So interestingly, HER2 and estrogen receptors still sort of stand a little bit on their own, that the amount of their expression determines the amount that we think the benefit is of that targeted treatment. But sasituzumab and uh, capivastertib are different in that when we look at what the biomarker would be, it doesn't seem to matter. What's interesting, and it is, oh, it is public. It was pu it was made public in a, uh, a financial press release on Friday, is that there are several HER2 directed medicines that are now being proven to even work in HER2-0 in the metastatic setting. So it's calling into question how much any of these things that we think really tell us exactly how much they benefit in the metastatic setting. Now, in the curative setting, we have a very tight correlation between benefit and expression of a particular molecular marker like ER, PR, HER2, um, and PDL sort of. In the metastatic setting, it looks like it really doesn't matter as much and people tend to benefit regardless of how much they express it. And that may be because in metastatic cancers, many of the cells are doing different things at the same time. And so however we measure it either may not be as accurate as we think it is, or it may be that metastatic cancers are always so on the go that you get a good benefit regardless of what you can pick up on testing. Dr. Honey, someone put a question in the chat about um, if there's any new data on AI length of treatment. So five years versus seven years versus 10 years. Yes. So the main update for 2023 is that Breast Cancer Index has published better prospective data that is new, showing that we can better assess who benefits from five versus 10 years of treatment with a breast cancer index test. So as someone is approaching the five-year mark or maybe just past the five-year mark, you can send breast cancer index testing on their initial cancer specimen that's in the freezer. 
And that can give you two pieces of information. Number one, what is the risk of late recurrence, which is what is the percent chance that the cancer can spread after the five-year mark? And number two, if you have that risk of late recurrence, what is the risk of late recurrence based on your actual tumor cell signaling that they can detect on your initial cancer specimen? What is the difference in your recurrence risk if you take five years of endocrine therapy versus 10? The benefit is that it's individualized. It is something that we can order. It is generally being approved by insurance to send. Uh, it is separate from the Oncotype test and gives you different information. It gives you late recurrence risk as opposed to now and chemo benefit. The challenge with it is that it does not yet have visible data on, well, what if I took five years of tamoxifen and then I take five years of AI? Or what if I took five years of this and then I take two and a half years of this? Like, what about the seven and a half year mark? Where did that go? And so this was truly something that looked at five versus 10 years of taking endocrine therapy, all comers, tamoxifen, ovarian suppression, AI. So it's a little bit general, but it's also highly personalized. The way they come up with that data is perspective, randomized, and it's based on estrogen receptor cell signaling in your initial tumor indicates late recurrence risk and benefit of further endocrine therapy after year five. That is the only new data that I have seen in 2023. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Oh, happy to help anytime. Well, and have a wonderful fall, everyone. Enjoy the lovely weather. Um, San Antonio will have some really important data. I think some of the things that will be most exciting from my perspective at San Antonio will really be where are we going with antibody drug conjugates? What are the new ones to look out for? And then for those of you that have triple negative on active treatment, uh, we have two new medicines that will be very likely uh, opening soon at our site for studying if we can increase the cure rate with triple negative after neoadjuvant therapy. So what, what these two will look like, and there will probably be preliminary data presented at San Antonio, or at least a clinical trials in progress is where you can see that as well, um, is for women with triple negative who get six months of neoadjuvant before surgery treatment, and then they go to surgery. If they have any cancer cells that survived the six months of treatment, then we have soon to be two studies opening with new medicines that would be either in addition to or instead of just using pembrolizumab or Keytruda, which is what we have available now. Uh, and so those will be super exciting. So I'm looking to see more about that. And I'm looking to see more about antibody drug conjugates. And I think uh, as usual, it will be another big year for breast oncology.